What's quacking guys, it's the Duck Chris, and it's time for a review of Desert Treasure 2. Desert Treasure 2 was one of the most anticipated updates of the year for me. The original quest came out in 2005, so it's high time we had a sequel. And the format of Desert Treasure 2 is something that I was really looking forward to, especially from the lead designer, Mod Ed. This quest was set to contain a lot of new lore, a lot of new areas, we got some new bosses with drops, and of course uh, puzzles and other fun things to do. I'll start with the puzzles. The puzzles of this quest I thought were relatively straightforward, but still interesting to do. This is something that a lot of people probably, either you love it or you hate it. There's a lot of puzzles where it requires uh, thinking and actually putting some pieces together instead of just kind of hit boss and click box. But I thought most of the puzzles were pretty good. The ice puzzles, probably were the weakest. They had some things like the slider puzzle where it sent you to the library and you had to look at some titles. I'm not sure exactly how that was supposed to get you to the slider for the W for the code, but I kind of guessed. But some of the other ones were a bit more straightforward, like the candles, um, like the, the beds and the directions. A little kind of a stretch but uh, we got there in the end but most of the other puzzles were pretty straightforward I think the like where to go for the blood area wasn't too bad although it did end up just being frustrating a little bit because the stranglers were were so fast um, the shadow puzzles um, was very interesting just such a new uh, area and and like I like the way that you progressed your tools in that one specifically um the way that it's like you would upgrade your torch and then you'd go back to the other area because you saw the old tentacles there that were stronger and uh the way that your like um shadow devices like helped you do things in new areas that you couldn't before i thought that was very cool and the way that you like kind of progressed through the puzzle and then the smoke puzzles in the brain i thought were pretty straightforward most of them like push this onto a corresponding pad or things where it was like combine the runes. Obviously we've done a lot of rune combining in the game before, so that's pretty straightforward, but it's cool to see like some new combos, like two minds make a soul, which was kind of, I thought that was pretty neat. Basically uh, giving some canonical new combinations that maybe we'll make use of someday in the future or not. But um, yeah, so the puzzles overall, there were some nice puzzles. There's variety in the puzzles. Um, and it definitely felt good to complete them with no quest helper. Um, the lore, the lore of this quest was kind of crazy. As we know from Desert Treasure 1, it introduced the Majorat as a new race. The race that has been fiercely divided between the Zamorakians and the Zerosians ever since the uh, God Wars. And that kind of continued in this one. We got to meet, um, you know, we got to see a lot of the, the Majorat that we've already met in the other quests kind of put their heads together and fight near the end and and it really kind of became clear who's on what side um and of course Sliske showed up which was great because Sliske is a huge character in the other runescape um well known as one of the tricky Majorats who is not really 100 percent on either side although he used to be a general in Zaros's empire and the Zarosian empire as a whole got a lot of drops we re learned that they were in league with the vampires, with Vardorvis being a vampire. We met the first Sithonian demon in old school, which is the Duke, as just like this huge maw of crushing mouths and eyes, which is so cool. They do show up in RS3, so I've seen them before, but it's very cool to see them here as a drop specifically. Um, and also uh, things like them handling the Elder Artifact. The Elder Artifact, the horn was revealed. Um, which was super cool. To my knowledge, this is an Elder Artifact that's never been revealed in Old RuneScape as well. Um, for those who don't know, like there was a bunch of Elder Artifacts. The Stone of Jazz is one. The Staff of Armadillo, which uh, Zamorak used to uh, stab um, Zaros is one. Um, there's also the Needle and a couple others. So it's cool to see the Elder Horn. It's always been talked about, but it's never been revealed. And now it's here. Sliske has it, and we know that uh, that's a very powerful. I like the way that the Elder Horn showed up. It looked old school, but it looked very powerful. It was kind of glowy, it was huge, it was in this vault, um, but it didn't have to turn your stats up to 200. It didn't have to 
you know, kill everyone in the room. It didn't have to really do anything crazy. It just had to do what it had to do, which was great. And I thought that was like a pretty interesting way to bring in an Elder Artifact, make it feel old school, but also make it very impressive. I liked the way, um, the lore about the Sirens and the Shadow Realm. And for those who don't know, the Shadow Realm, the Blackstone, are all connected to this mysterious deity called Zhao Tak in Ars 3. And while they don't explicitly name him here, there's definitely some drops. He has this catchphrase that uh, is associated with him where he says, do you really think you can save them? And they say that in this quest, which just gave me these little chills. It was so cool. And that whole storyline there about um, the mysterious deity that lives in the shadow realm and is kind of climbing, coming into the world through uh, under the ocean and like dragging people down to the ocean and people succumb to his will. It's very like Lovecraftian in a way, which is pretty cool. And uh, I think it fits really well with the Lassar Undercity. And obviously the Whisperer is just such a cool aesthetic boss that, um, you know, brings the Sirens as a race more into focus, which we have only started to hear about them from the Eastern lands and stuff. So very cool to have those in here. And then the Scar as a whole was pretty interesting, very much tied into the Abyss and, uh, you know, um, Guardians of the Abyss, um, Guardians of the Rift, that's what it's called. Yeah. Yeah, the whole abyss idea where there's like living tissue and that sort of thing. I didn't 100% understand how the Zarosian ships got in the scar. Like I know that they were probably looking for the battle for the Eye of Ceridomen. There was like the Battle of the Eye and then they got lost or sunk somehow. And then the horn was with them, but then was stolen. It's not 100% clear. I'm sure it's there. It just, you know, there's always more to discover basically. But I like the area, the Leviathan that lived there was kind of interesting. I'm, again, not sure how totally it was brought in, but um, it's a cool boss and definitely interesting. Um, the new areas as a whole I thought were very cool. The, um, the Scar, as I just mentioned, I thought it fit really well with the aesthetic of the Abyss and the existing old school areas. Um, the Stranglewood, again kind of fit well with the Shazian rework, which is interesting that they did that rework recently and then put the Stranglewood in because they seem to mesh so well. That it's almost like, were they already thinking of the Stranglewood when they put the Shazian rework into the game? Which would be pretty cool if they were, and it definitely turned out quite well. Um, the Gorak prison was kind of an extension of the area that we'd already seen before with the Muspa quest. Although that's kind of part of this quest too, because it's a, pre a prequel. But I liked the way that there were different passageways that kind of twisted and turned. And overall, it just was like a very expansive place with a ton of different rooms and levels and stuff. That was very cool. And it was fun to like try to work out where to go. Um, and definitely like hope that they use that space for more things in the future. So it doesn't feel necessarily so empty. The Lasar Undercity was kind of similar. It was a bit empty in terms of like it being so big but that's just because it was so big and cool the first time i dropped in i was like whoa this place is huge and like literally everyone that i watched was playing the quest or that was streaming i had the same reaction everyone was like so shocked that it was huge like not only like you get off the, there's the throne and you're like oh this room's cool then there's the plaza right next to it and then there's this whole northern area and this whole southern area and it's like that's only looks like to be one quarter of like the actual city that was Lasar, and with the cathedral in the middle where the si the whisperer is and stuff. So pretty crazy in terms of like how big that actually is. And I hope that they use that area again in the future for something, which would be pretty cool. Finally, the bosses. I thought the bosses, the design of them visually and aesthetically were very cool. They're all so different but ultimately do keep somewhat to the blood, ice, smoke, and shadow themes. I like the way that they bring in all the different races that are all over the world. And also when you show up to the boss fight, they have that cutscene, which was super cool where it like gives you the name and it's like the whisperer and then it like comes out of the water. Like that was so sick. And I really hope uh, they do stuff like that in the future. Um, and then, yeah, let's get into the actual bosses, like, post 
quest because that's part of this update, of course. It's not just a quest, it has um, bosses. So start with the drops. I thought the drops were going to be kind of underwhelming and they kind of are, but not necessarily. Turns out the Bellator ring having 20 slash, I think it is, is kind of crazy along with six strength bonus. And it definitely makes the scythe like a lot more accurate at some places, which is pretty cool. Um, the Ultor ring, yeah, still keeping up three strength bonus, definitely, or three uh, max hits standard is very good. Um, the mage ring being two max hits standard on staff is kind of nuts and definitely even more i think it's three max hits in tombs of Masket. obviously we use light bear a lot in there but i'm sure it'll be useful because people love max hits and even the range ring like as probably the weakest of the four because it doesn't always give a max you know range strength is range strength and it'll be useful eventually and of course it still gives accuracy so the ring's definitely more impactful than I thought. I really like the way that they do the uh, triple sub drop thing to have bad luck protection. It's definitely, it was definitely confusing day one when we didn't have any drops, but it seems like we've kind of figured out that it is working properly. And I like the idea of it being much less likely to go super dry. I've previously said that the bludgeon is one of the best designed weapons in the game in terms of its drop system, and this is pretty much that, only more exciting because you don't know when you're getting a piece, you only get that final dopamine hit of the final drop. The axe, I like in theory. I like the way that the pieces are the opposite of the ring pieces, where like when you're going for ring pieces, you want to stay at one boss, but when you're going for the axe, you want to shift around all the four bosses. So you kind of have to pick and choose like which you're going for. The only thing is that the axe is just a bit weak, which is totally, un you know, it's it's like acceptable and it's I understandable really because you wouldn't want to make it necessarily power more powerful than the scythe. But at the same time for something that's so rare, it probably should be a bit better. Maybe you just up its damage versus one by one and two by two targets specifically so that like the three by three monsters you still have the scythe being better i don't really know exactly how else you would make it better other than to just buff it and buff the scythe at the same time but that's kind of for the j mods to decide so i'll let them talk about that and yeah other than that i don't feel like yeah vertus is cool vertus is cool it doesn't seem to be uh upsetting any metas crazily but it's still holding good value because of that middle of the middle ground between Arams and Ancestral and also good for Slayer and stuff. So yeah, definitely a cool niche item. And I think it's a, a good addition to the game. Overall, I think the bosses have pretty much enough drops. They don't need a prayer book for sure. Like this is definitely enough of a game change on its own with these four bosses, the rings and the ax um, and Virtus. So I think it, the drops are pretty good. The mechanics of the boss I found very interesting, specifically in the way that the difficulty is balanced compared to other things in the game. If you'll notice the way people are talking about this update right now, the higher level players are not really complaining too much about it being boring. I mean, part of that's down to the, the Awakened versions being out, but the truth is that these are more interesting bosses than a lot of other bosses that we've had recently. Bodhi called Vardorv as the most fun boss in the game. You know, it's pretty interesting. There's a lot of new things or things that are efficient to do at other bosses, but you're only now being forced to do them. And I think that's very important because of the other half of the equation, the people that are just struggling to get their quest cape. Some of them have been saying that these bosses are a bit too hard. And I think that's exactly where we need to be. It needs to be a bit too hard compared to existing quest bosses so that it's getting those people to the higher levels of PVM. Because things like switching your prayers every tick, like you have to do it, Whisperer, um, watching for environmental damage while taking damage from the boss, like uh, you know, you're doing at Vardorvis, things like um, maintaining, being able to cast spells while doing ranged damage and moving around with an object um, avoiding tornadoes, like that sort of thing, like that you're doing at Leviathan, and even things like the Duke, where it's like, okay, you're meleeing, but you also have to step back and move around and, and dodge things on the floor. 
Um, those are all things that we have to do at other parts of the game if you want to play efficiently, if you want to play at a high level. But you could probably get a quest cape without doing any of those beforehand. Now you have to do them. And it's making so that the mid-level, the lower mid-level people in the game, they are going to have to learn advanced PVM techniques. Advanced, at least somewhat advanced, like mid-level, high-level PVM techniques. And maybe once you learn those there, then you're not as intimidated when it comes to something like TOB and you have to do a melee hit step back like you do at Duke. So I think this is a very important part of the process in terms of making content accessible and interesting. We have had a big movement toward accessibility recently where things like Tombs of Masket are becoming very easy to do in terms of at least like getting into the content and learning the mechanics one by one. And now this is the other half of the equation. It's like bring the floor up and then help people reach their ceiling. You know, it's giving them the steps to climb to reach the higher levels, which I think is super important. And it's definitely something that's a healthy addition to the game. Overall, I thought these bosses are really fun to do. I've been doing Whisperer. I've been doing Duke. Uh, I've been watching streams of the other two. And definitely, I like the way that there's multiple weapons viable. Um, except for, I guess, Whisperer is kind of mage only. But, you know, you can still use Sang and stuff. Um, you know, at, at Leviathan, I, I still don't know exactly what's best. At Vardorvis, there seems to be a couple different methods where you can use Alt, you can use Lightbearer, you can use Alter, you can use Bellator, you can use Fang, Scythe, Axe. You know, there's a whole bunch of things you can use. Um, at Duke, you know, Scythe seems to be best, but you can still use Arclight, you can use Axe, you can use Fang, um, you can use BGS, you can use um, Ancient God Sword, Claws, Void Waker, like, it's great. It's great that there's options for what to kill the boss with, that there's not just one thing that's the best and everything else sucks, and it's more about the mechanics. It's not so much about the stats, it's about you mastering the mechanics and making sure that you can really farm the boss with ease. Overall, I think this update was great. It really lived up to the reputation of a sequel to one of the greatest quests ever. It kept the theme of Desert Treasure 2, it expanded on the quest in every way in terms of lore, puzzles, uh, rewards, new areas and bosses, and I'm really happy with it. Uh, the only dra drawbacks, again, tiny little puzzle changes, maybe a little bit more rewards from the bosses. So overall, I'll give it a nine out of 10. If you liked this video, leave a like. Tell me what you thought of Desert Treasure 2. What would you rate it? Did you enjoy the bosses? Are you dry on any rings yet? Have you got the X? What about pets? What is your favorite eye that the Duke looks at you with? And until next time, peace out.